Welcome to a new video. Let's take a look at some new malicious compliance stories. The first story is called, Don't ask for the boss's phone number. So I drive an 18-wheeler. Not only that, but I own my truck and my business. One day, while coming into Laredo, Texas, I was in the turning lane for my exit and this car whips out in front of me. Not really having enough room to stop, I turned onto the shoulder, threw on the air horn, which is extremely loud when you're next to the truck and stopped right beside the guy. He proceeds to get out of his car with his phone and starts taking pictures of my truck and plate. By this time the light had turned green, so I gave him a few short horn honks to tell him to get going. He then beats on my door, so I roll my window down and he starts screaming about his ears hurting and how I'm damaging his ability to hear. He then demands that I give him my boss's number and my driver's license number, so he can call it in and report me and have my job for this. And he proceeded to move his car to the shoulder and back so close to my bumper, I couldn't get around him. I kind of smirked at him and told him he didn't want to speak to my boss because he's is a short-tempered man and that he wouldn't like what my boss would have to say about this issue. But he insisted that he wants to speak to my boss. I also told him if he wanted to call me in, all he'd needed was the numbers on the side of my truck since it's assigned to me. Considering I only own one truck, you can imagine what I would assign my truck number to be. I gave him my cell phone number and watched as he laughed while speaking each number as he dialed. I see his number pop up on my phone mounted to the windshield. He couldn't see it from his angle. I tried to hold in my laughter. I let it ring for a minute and he's getting impatient, the whole time traffic is going around us. I finally picked up the phone and answered it. Transport company here. How can I help you? His face turns to beat red. He proceeds to yell at me some more and tells me it isn't over because now he has my number. A week later I get a phone call from a number I didn't have saved in my phone. I had forgotten about the incident but thought it might be a broker or a customer. I answer the phone and this lady chirps up. Turns out it was his mother and she wanted monetary compensation for her son's troubles. I asked if she knew what had even happened and she tells me some story about how his bumper was damaged by my truck and that he was scared to talk to me because me driving an 18-wheeler was intimidating to him. Being a smart owner, I have a camera in my truck. And I dump all my truck footage onto my hard drive, so I asked her if she could receive videos over email. She said sure but wasn't sure what I was about to send her. I spend a minute or two looking through the hard drive on my laptop and find the video of the incident and send it to her. While still on the phone, I can hear the audio playing as she watched it. Her tone changed in an instant and I heard her put the phone down, and all hell broke loose in the house. There was Spanish screaming, things being thrown and lord knows what else going on. It reminded me of that movie, A Christmas Story, when Ralphie's mum calls that lady about the curse word and hears the apocalypse on the phone. It was kind of like that but in Spanish. She then comes back to me and very kindly asks for two things. First, she asks that I forget she called and act as if this never happened because she was embarrassed to no end. And second, if I could delete the video of her son's idiocy. I told her that number one was fine, I could do that. But as far as number two, I would not delete the footage, but the only way anyone other than me or her would see it is if it was needed for a court case. She wished me a good day and hung up the phone. The next story is called, How about a good teacher for a change? I think it's still malicious compliance if you goad people into demanding the thing you maliciously comply with, right? This happened in fourth grade elementary school. Our class had been complaining about our projects in art. The art teacher was going over painting and drawing and we were getting bored and begging to do something else. He says that we'll do some other stuff. We had two months of pottery, carving sculptures out of bars of soap, all sorts of fun stuff. While we'd work on our projects, the teacher always told us stories. Some true, some not. But his favorite kind were ghost stories. Eventually, he figured the stories about ghosts in the school were the scariest. Pretty soon he started telling made-up stories about the ghost that lived in the school. Over the weeks, while we shaped our pottery and did our carving, the stories grew to include sightings of the ghost in the school's basement. This basement was a cellar. Perfectly safe but the floor was usually a bit damp, it was dusty and dingy, etc. We only ever went there for tornado drills. Eventually, he started telling us how he saw the ghost down there. Then how the ghost was even there during the day. All in a way designed to intrigue, and perhaps scare, fourth graders. Pretty soon my classmates were demanding to go down to the basement and see the ghost. He'd say, no, it's too scary. That made people more demanding. Finally, he said, do you want to see a ghost in the basement? Most of the class screamed, yes. He asked, are you sure? And now the whole class screamed, yes. He reminded us, it's pretty scary. But we didn't care, let us see. He warned us, you'll scream. We said, no, we won't. Okay, have it your way. 
But don't say I didn't warn you. The boys in the class were all bragging about how they weren't scared. The girls were all huddled with their friends. Finally, the day arrived. Now, this is going to be scary. It's okay to scream but don't try to run. I don't want anyone to fall down there. Nervous laughs and nods from the class. Does anybody want to stay in the classroom instead of going down? No raised hands but some apprehensive looks. We all went down to the basement. Everything was normal. Then the teacher suddenly switched off the lights. And that was when we saw a ghost, shimmering in the distance, with its eerily human-like face peering at us. There were screams, from both boys and girls. It was loud. Then he switched the light back on and we heard the teacher laughing, loudly. After some badgering, he pointed to the large white towel hanging from a pipe at the far end of the basement, gently waving in the breeze. He asked, is there where you saw the ghost? With some stuttering, we answered yes. He asked, was it glowing? Again, with stuttering, we said yes. And then finally he asked, did you know that you can buy paint that glows in the dark? Cue the predictable responses from the fourth graders and demands for him to show us how he did it and let us try. It didn't dawn on me until yesterday, when I told this story to my kids a couple of decades after it happened, that this whole thing was a two-month wind-up on the teacher's part. Because after we saw the ghost, of course, we demanded to know how he did it. We demanded to try the glow in the dark paint ourselves and did. We got a lesson on using paint you can't see very well. We learned about unusual mediums, including cotton towels. We then went back to other painting type items in art with excitement and demands to the teacher to try all sorts of kinds of paint and painting. Which was probably his plan all along. I'm sure he covered everything in his lesson plan that year, just slightly out of order, and with much more enthusiastic kids. The third story is called, You Want to Speak to My Manager? Before being a bartender, I worked at a retail chain. I'm a nerd, I tend to switch to autopilot when tired, almost always at the end of shifts and can be a jerk when annoyed. It was a slow Wednesday afternoon, the air conditioning was broken again and it was about 5 degrees Celsius hotter inside than it is outside. I'm in autopilot, rigor mortis smile on my face and retail greetings are droning out of my throat. A guy walks into my register, demanding a refund for something trivial. Probably his panties were the wrong color, I don't remember. I inform him in a monotone voice that refunds are issued by my supervisor, not me. There's a surprisingly substantial line at the supervisor's desk, people wanting refunds or information. He informs me that he's not waiting that long for something trivial. He demands I do it, because even someone as stupid as you can do this. Well, that snapped me out of autopilot and the smile fades. I repeat, in a much more direct tone that only the supervisor can do refunds. The customer is having none of it. Refund my item. He demands again, saying it very slowly as if I was the dumbest potato in the strawberry patch. I am unable to. He cuts me off. I want to speak to your manager, I don't want to talk to you. Now, this is where people need to be careful with their words. As a cashier, I report directly to my supervisor, one of the two at the desk. They're in charge of me. My manager sits out in the back, managing the store, and usually never has to interact with customers unless the supervisor calls him. So I nod, calling through the headset for my manager. Let's call him Fred. Fred's a great guy, he tells good jokes, he's always ready to help his friends and he's a caring soul. He's also a mute. And after wrapping his car around a tree as a teen, he's also deaf. As such he knows Australian Sign Language but can't read lips to save his life. I also can't speak sign language at all. This probably took about 5 minutes for someone to alert Fred that he was needed and for him to come down. All this time I'm smiling but not saying a word to the gentleman, as he told me to. He comes up to the registers, sees it's me waving him down and pulls out his PDA to communicate with me. What's up? Fred types. I take the PDA and type, customer has a complaint and wants to speak to my manager, not me. Fred raises an eyebrow at me and I just shrug. The guy is turning red with anger, probably thinking we're ignoring him. Fred turns to the guy, who launches into a full-on verbal assault that would curdle milk chocolate. Something about incompetent employees and terrible service. Fred just stands there. Eventually, the guy runs out of breath and Fred has a chance to show him the PDA with the words, Sir, I am a deaf mute, please use this to communicate with me. The guy practically screams and storms out of the store. The next story is called, Policy Used Against Human Resources. I used to work for a big, global company at one of their many big sites as an operations manager. I loved the job but hated the company. I hadn't gone by my legal name in about 12 years at this point. Everyone knew me by another name. I used it everywhere, all my clients used it, and my name badge even used this name as there was a section for preferred name when I started right there on my application. 
I had zero problems up until the new human resource manager arrived. She was a nasty cow and especially disliked me. At around 8 months of working there, I still hadn't received any business cards and had put in many requests for them over time. I think maybe the new human resource manager thought she was going to pull one on over me as she did indeed get my business cards printed and delivered all 300 to me, all written with my legal name. I questioned this and was told it was company policy and that I would need to write my preferred name on each card if I wanted to keep using it. Even though several other managers also didn't use their legal names and yet had their business cards printed as they wished, I was singled out. She was extremely smug about it. I had never worried about changing my name legally as it had honestly never really been an issue. People will generally call you whatever you introduce yourself as. But well, the opportunity came knocking at my door, didn't it? I spent $160 and a full day at the courts changing my name legally and while I'm there, I'll just change my last name too. I was never attached to it and this one is much better. I also went and applied for a new driver's license and spent the rest of the afternoon faxing my new documents off to the many places that would need them. It was a lot of work and it did end up costing me about $200 all up. But walking into work the next day was the most satisfying day of my time there. I was able to hand over my official change of name certificate and I handed the human resource manager back all 300 brand new, completely unused business cards with my now previous name. And to top it off, she had to update all my files and my contract, send everything to head office to be completed, and then had to come crawling back to my office for me to sign each one with my new name. It probably explained the vindictiveness she displayed later but I ended up quitting not long after. I doubt the head office would have liked having to fork out for another set of business cards, either. And sure, I had to spend a bit of time and money doing it. But it was something I should have done a long time ago, anyway. I just got a little shove in the right direction and the payout was so satisfying. The last story is called, You Won't Listen To Me? So every Friday, from 9 to 1, I volunteer at a pretty large hospital in my area. I have done it for a little under a year and really enjoy it. I do tons of stuff there, things like taking flowers, mail, or any assorted gifts to patients in their rooms or staff. I take lab samples from the units down to the lab in the basement when the vacuum tubing that transports them quicker doesn't work, which is almost always in one unit or another. I pick up supplies from the warehouse. I take family members to see their family members, who might be there as a patient. So I am pretty much an all-around, one-stop shop volunteer. Given the nature of what I do there, I pretty much have access to most of the hospital. The list goes on of things we do but the one thing that we do that doesn't happen that often is discharge patients. Usually, at the hospital, someone from the unit like a nurse or volunteer stationed there that would take them down to the exit or their car. When they get busy and can't make a discharge, they call us. So one day about a month ago I was sitting in the volunteer office, talking with the other volunteers when we get a call to discharge a patient. And I was tasked to do it. Great, I get to meet another person and work on my interpersonal skills, which are not the greatest. I look at the slip and it's to a unit that is almost on the other side of the hospital. No problem, some more steps in for me. I grab a wheelchair and it takes a good 8 minutes to get there. The door where the patient is, is closed, so I knock and I get let in. I see a middle-aged woman I assume to be a daughter and an older gentleman, that had to be around 90 years old, who was the patient. I introduce myself, hi, my name is this. I'm here to take you home today. Before I get to say anything else, I get a remark from the lady saying, what took you so long? The nurse said she called 10 minutes ago. I respond, well, the volunteer office is on the other side of the hospital, so it took me that long to get here. She seems satisfied with that response. I go ahead and get the man in the wheelchair and I ask where the car is. The lady says that it is in the green garage, which is over by the volunteer office. Great, even more steps, I think to myself. So I start to go back the way I came, and lady doesn't seem to like this way. Wait. Where do you think you're going? The way is this way. She points in a different direction, towards an elevator. The elevator she points to is a rather small elevator, not meant for patient transport that goes to the second floor. Which where we are takes us largely some operating rooms. It's largely for staff for a quick way from one floor to another. Sorry, I'm pretty sure it's this way. That way doesn't go to the green garage. Yes, it does. I've been here many times and I know for a fact that it does. She is technically right. There is a way you can get there but you have to go through quite a few keycard access only doors. The only way she would have come from that way is that she was escorted through. I do have access through this way too. The elevator you want to go in is not meant for patient transport and I am not allowed in there with a patient. I don't care. I want to go this way. I am the customer and the customer always comes first. 
She is starting to get irate at the moment like a three-year-old. Me, perplexed, this is a hospital, not a store. Patient safety comes first and because of that, I am not allowed to go that way with a patient. What do you do here anyway? Are you like a nurse or something? No, I am a volunteer. I do a lot of things around the hospital. So you don't even work here. You must be new or something because you don't seem to know your way around. I, not wanting to take it further, agree to go her way. After the, you must be new here, snippet I had it and I was done arguing. So we head into the cramped elevator with man in his wheelchair, me and the lady and go up a floor. She said, just follow me. I'll show you the right way. I'm thinking, whatever you say. So we walk down this hallway with her in the lead and me and man behind her being quiet. After about a minute or so we come across the first keycard door, which is the correct way. She tries to open it and it won't budge to a confused face. Then she notices the scanner and asks me to open it for her. I, still upset at the way she's acting and maybe being a bit petty just says, I can't. I don't have access through here. Even though I did. She said, now I remember, it was this way. We turn around to go back past the elevator and make a right down another hallway. This hallway has what appeared to be towards the way to the operating rooms, based on the signs she has seemed to ignore. More locked doors, which I don't have access to. I asked, did you want to go back the way we came to now? She was clearly lost, but still said, no, I am sure the way is here somewhere. Alrighty then. We turn around again, making it back to the main hallway where the original elevator is. We then continue in the direct opposite of the way we want to go. After a few more closed ends, I can tell the older man is getting aggravated with the woman. He said, Karen, not her real name, let's just go the way this nice lady wants to go. She seems to know where she is going. The lady stops. She looks at the man, then me. She then looks around at the maze of hallways and doors, looks down and in a very defeated voice, she says, all right, we'll go her way. We go back down the elevator, and after two turns, it's a straight shot to the green garage. No one says a word until we get to the exit and I ask the lady to get the car and pull around. After she leaves, the man starts apologizing to me, saying that she's always like this, stuff like that. We start a conversation, he's telling me about his life experiences and he seemed to be a really nice guy. The lady pulls her car around, the man gets in and I just smile and wave them goodbye and wish them a nice weekend, as I do with all the discharges. Thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider subscribing to the channel for more content. Let me know what you think about the stories in the comment section below. Have a great day. Bye bye.